Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. Climate change has been top of mind on business and government agendas in recent years. But we don't often talk about climate change in past millennia, how it was affected by earlier civilizations, and how climate affected human adaptation in turn. My guest today does just that in his latest book, The Earth Transformed, An Untold History. He is international best-selling author and historian, Peter Frankopan. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining us all the way from Oxford. Well, I wish I was with you live in person. I love coming to South Africa, but ho hopefully some point soon. It would be lovely to have you here and hope to meet you one day soon here in South Africa. But before we get into a brief look at what readers can expect in The Earth Transformed, let me mention two of your earlier books, um, The Silk Roads, which was published in 2015, sold to my knowledge about 400,000 copies in the UK and over 1 million copies worldwide. And that was followed by New Silk Roads, which was met with critical acclaim in 2018. So Peter, I'd like to actually start with your process. Um, looking at this book, it is quite hefty. There's a lot of research and thought that went into it. When did you actually start thinking about it? And when did you start researching? How many years went into this? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, it's a, lo it's, it's a lovely question to be asked. Um, well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, an academic historian, and my, my job, I think, is to answer big questions. So the, the books that I've written before about the Silk Roads are, I, th I suppose, about the, the biggest geopolitical trend of the next century, which is the emergence of a new world that isn't dependent on the West. And that includes, of course, uh, Africa as a, taken as a whole, many different countries and peoples uh, of Africa, but also the rise of Asia, in particular China and what China is doing globally and locally, regionally and so on. And I'd have thought that the, the next biggest, really important question that that scholars and thinkers should be thinking about is uh, how our world is going to change in the 21st century in other ways. And, and top of that list by far is both, both changing climates. You know something about that in South Africa, the unusual weather conditions you've had in the last 24 months, I think, make that very clear. But also um, ways in which we're changing the ecologies around us. It's not just about global warming and, and, ch and, and climatic change. It's about the natural environment. So I suppose I've been working on that and thinking about that since I was since I was a boy. I'm a child of the Cold War. So I grew up in the 1970s where um, the questions that, that were overlaid with the political stuff, uh, with apartheid and justice, all the other things that we were told about on the news were things like acid rain and the worry that there'd be a nuclear confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union that would lead to um, environmental catastrophe. So that's been part of my upbringing. That all sort of stopped at the early 90s. The world looked like it was becoming a different and safer and better place in a change again in South Africa. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, the, the ways in which we thought the world was all becoming richer, more connected. Turns out that, in fact, what it was doing as well as that, maybe not instead of as well, was becoming more fragile. And the, the pandemic was quite a good example of that. The fact that we're so closely connected means one person falls ill in one part of the world and the rest of us are all brought brought along with those the, those connections. So I, I've been thinking and working on these things for quite a long time. And for the last 10 years or so, uh, looking at climate change has been as an important part of, of what I've been working on. Mm -hmm. So as well, you for this particular book, you went more into scientific research as well. How was it for you to break away a little bit from pure history and into, into the scientific field? Well, like I tell our kids, you know, learning doesn't stop when you finish school and you get your certificates. Um, you've got to keep learning for the whole of your life. So there's no embarrassment or shame in trying to pick up new skills. So if you'd asked me 10 years ago, would I know something about genomics or about statistical modeling or plant sciences, uh, I, you'd have drawn quite a blank look. But um, it's amazing if you study and learn that even as an old spanker like me, you can you can pick up new skills. Um, and so so learning is important. But I think I'm living in the in, in, I'm, I'm part of a generation of uh, historians that is probably the most important series of changes since the invention of writing scripts. Mm -hmm. So um, it used to be as a historian looking at the past, you would look at objects and archaeology and texts. But now the new tools that we have to chart, a lot of them are related to climate, for example, tree ring data to see how rainfall levels change, uh, fossilized pollen, you can tell how much landscapes are being disturbed by human activity or by animal activity and how that changes. 
Uh, you can look at genomics and you can tell how people are moving and migrating. So you don't just have to rely on the fact that languages are similar or people look the same. You can measure this. And the the, the sheer weight of this kind of material, it's, it's literally the same, if not greater, than the first uh, humans who learned how to write things down. So these last 20 years, it is incredible for me and, and others, you know, other scholars at the moment. It's, it's more or less the most exciting time to be a historian for the last four or five thousand years because of these new tools that are available. So to rewrite and to look back at history with access to these kinds of materials, um, it is it is uh, not just reinventing the wheel. It's, I think it's a completely new way in which we can look at history. So let's let's go back to to the start of uh, your book, where uh, you go even further back um, in in history and the and the existence of the Earth. How different would the planet have been if it had not been transformed the way it did? Is it feasible to argue that the world could have been a very strange place if events following the Big Bang deviated just slightly from the course that they took? Yeah, so look, it, it is quite a chunky book, you're quite right, but it does cover four and a half billion years. So it works out at about a dollar per, per 300 million years. So, you know, you get good value for money, but it, 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 is, it is, you know, I do, I do think it's important that we think about long-term history. And when you start thinking about long-term history, first thing you'll know is that for uh, almost the entirety of Earth's existence, uh, our, our own life form wouldn't have been supported because of the, the, the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere. So we human beings have only been on this planet for uh, 0.001% of its history. And I think that that then starts to give you a, 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 a return to some of those levels lessons in biology that you'll remember from the classroom. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, the world is, it's the hottest it's been for the last 125,000 years globally, and also has the highest concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the last 2 million years. And 2 million years in the Earth's history, is, it's really a blink of an eye, given we go back 4.5 billion years. So was the world a different place? Well, all the continents were in different locations. They were all jumped together. We find... Um, Sea, sea, sea life, marine fossils on the top of the Himalayas. So, top of Mount Everest, you find uh, dead animals that used to be living in the water because Mount Everest and the Himalayas used to be on the seabed. So, that world looked completely different. And because it's changed, because there have been a tectonic shift, the plates moving around, because of massive volcanic eruptions, and because of the way in which the, the moon used to be half of, well, the moon used to be part of our, our Earth, and then a, a, an impact about the size of Mars broke it off that it was completely unrecognizable. And we're beneficiaries of all of those changes, uh, as will all biological life forms in the future. And, and one thing that you learn, I think, from human history and also from biological history, is if you don't adapt or evolve or find a way of countering ecological environmental change, then other animals and species take your place. That's, that's why we roam the Earth today and our good friends, the dinosaurs, don't. <laughs> Yeah, so as well, if we if we look at climate change and the, the how important it has been in the discussions at, at the COP um, conferences and the last COP in, in Egypt that we had, and um, how people were talking as well about emissions and how the certain parts of the world are responsible for more of the e emissions. For Africa, that is particularly uh, pertinent yeah. because um, the continent doesn't have that many emissions but pay the price for it. Would you comment on that? please well it's, it's absolutely true i mean it's it's awful it's and it's in fact it's worse than that so africa produces a tiny fraction of the emissions and not only gets the least amount of finance to be able to make green transitions it's going to be the most directly exposed and hit to uh, global warming climate changes and the consequences that come as a result of that so water shortages crop failures disease migration and, and so on so no it's it's deeply uh, unfair and um, you know and and very very difficult. I, I was in Pakistan yesterday. Pakistan produces one percent of the of the world's emissions. It's the fifth most populated country on earth, and um, it's hugely exposed to um, climate events. Not just not just long term warming over the next decades, uh, but last September there were floods that displaced thirty million people, and produced forty but nearly forty billion dollars worth of losses that were almost all uninsured. And that produces a you know, huge cost to the government to be able to replace revenues, prices surge, and it's catastrophic. So I'm, I'm hugely sympathetic to the discussions around the fact that industrialized nations uh, who are by and large responsible for the most of the emissions of the past, countries like China at the moment, 
uh, burns more than six times the next, more coal than the next six countries combined, about how rich people should put their hands in their pockets to help the poor um, and less developed. But it doesn't happen quickly. Uh, it might not happen at all. So the challenge is while those discussions go on, what should countries like South Africa or other countries and places in sub-Saharan Africa or Northern Africa, where 13 of the 19 most exposed countries to global warming are in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, what, should, what, should, what, what do they need to do now rather than try to get politicians around the table to get them to, to pay some form of compensation or at the very least to invest? So, you know, the continent of Africa as a whole receives less than 1% of all finance into green technologies. And Africa as a whole um, could solve solar, could solve clean renewable energies at a stroke. Um, but these structural unfairnesses are things that uh, lots of people spend time in boardrooms asking for and trying to solve that I don't see a huge amount of progress. So what's more important from my perspective is how to provide resilience, how to build up the capabilities of African states to be able to cope with things that are already happening now. And what is it that they need to be able to cope with emergencies? What do they need to be able to invest and get their young, young entrepreneurs and technologies to scale quickly that allows people who are most exposed to be able to be resilient in the future? And being practical, I think, is more important than letting, hot, letting politicians do what they usually do, which is blow hot air and accuse each other of things without fixing them. So if we look at, at resilience as well, and we have about a minute, and just look at resilience in the past, in, in history, how civilizations rose and fell, and uh, so resilience moved from one area of the world to another. Well, you know, uh, uh, hopefully your your viewers and listeners will have a chance to read my book. But, you know, I think it's really important to think about who managed to get things right, because by and large, the human history is about things getting things, people getting things wrong, which is why the global centers today are not in Great Zimbabwe, not in Uruk, not in Kilwa on the Swahili coast, uh, not in Angkor in Cambodia, but in places like London and New York and so on. So um, being in charge of your ecological capabilities, being able to cope with changes. It's hugely important, but northern countries and northern Europe are very late in their arrivals to becoming global leaders. Four or five hundred years ago, if you wanted wealth and prestige and uh, sophistication, uh, you were nowhere near Europe. You were in the Middle East, in particular in Egypt. Uh, a thousand years before that, you were in Central America, in India and so on. So I think that being, being able to understand what's coming and uh, being able to cope with your ecological uh, lottery of cards that you've been given, who've been dealt, is significant. And as a professor, I would always say the first thing to do is learn from the past. And there are some really important lessons that, that can teach you. Peter, the, uh, I had so many questions that I would have liked to ask you still about the book, because the, there is just so many interesting facts in the book. Um, thank you so much for coming on and uh, chatting to us. Hope to see you again. Please, please have me back if your readers and viewers want me, if your viewers want me, let you know. But thank you so much for having okay. me. Thanks so much, Peter Frankopan. The Earth Transformed and Untold History will appeal to readers interested in global and current affairs, the climate crisis and geography, and it is important in the debate around how lessons from the past can be used to help inform our ideas about the present and the future. Thanks for watching. Bye.